There you go. <laughs> How so it you look? got it working, huh? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now I can. Okay. Okay. Hey, hey how's it. the picture? Well, it's a little straight. Why is it so narrow? I don't, okay. I don't know. Good question. Because yesterday I had like a wide screen. Was it the way you turned right, the camera? Right. Okay, let's, oh, how's that? If you turn no. it this way, if you turn, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. that's better. Okay. Jackie, yeah. I see Wait, all of you. I got to set it up. Let me see. Wait, look. <laughs> how's that? It's good. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, but how's the picture? Picture's perfect. Okay. Yeah, just don't talk, go too far away from the camera because otherwise, otherwise the, um, I can't, we can't hear you. Okay. Wait a minute. Let me just make sure I got everything shut up. Okay. Got you. I uh, I spoke to, I spoke to Daryl this morning, your brother. Oh, okay. I was I was up at Kim's place at uh, uh, Futures. Right. It's really spectacular. I have to tell you, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's a beautiful hey, uh, place. Okay. I want one thing. Hold on a second. Hey, I need it. Do you have the telephone number to Futures? Uh, I've got Kim's number. Do you want that? That's the number I use. I have Kim's number. No, I'll just. I'm just going to do um. Uh, the Strawberry Center, that's all. Yeah. yeah. I just normally call, um, I just normally, normally, uh, would call, call Kim on her cell phone. Yeah, I've got somebody maybe for, for Daryl. Um, so, so when I was there at Kim's place, we, we called him and, uh, <laughs> okay. It was, uh, was he on the golf course at home? You know, I don't know where, I presume, I don't know where he was. I mean, all I know is that, uh, Kim's like, oh, let me get Daryl on the phone. So, you know, a stranger, it's still a little odd for me to be speaking on the phone with Daryl Strawberry, you know what I mean? Everybody, I do know what you're saying, because everybody that runs into him gets taken back, you know, Daryl Strawberry. Daryl Strawberry. Yeah, man, what a legend in baseball, you know. I know. Just, hey, listen, listen to me, Kevin, Mark. The stuff I've seen him go through when he was playing baseball and it played out on the national stage, you know, with his drug addiction, you know, his family got pulled into the mix, everything. Hey, the media just beat him up. I don't think I could have handled that. So he's a very raw, very strong human being. To yeah. Go and actually, you know, what I said to him was, I said, you know, Daryl, I said, you must have done something right in a past life. I said, because between your wife, Kim, mm -hmm. and Raw, I said, I mean, I don't know if you get a better, better friends than that. I, so I said, yeah. so he, he was laughing. I said, you may have messed up this lifetime, but apparently in a past life, you did something very right. Yeah. Surrounded yeah, by yeah. people who wanted to save you and apparently yeah. love you. So, that bro not has been point. through a whole lot, man. He's been through a whole lot. He has. I'm to, hey, stay, stay right there. I'm, trying I'm with to... you. We got, we got a couple minutes. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to elevate this. I got books. Hold on one second. I want this a little higher. Okay. I wanted to stay still. I'll be right with you. No problem. Okay. Oh, are we echoing? Are we echoing? No, we're okay now. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah, I just don't want to just like. Okay. So we'll go live in like two minutes, and basically I'll just give my little spiel at right the beginning of the show, and I'll introduce you, and then we'll just, you know, we'll like we did yesterday, we'll just have a conversation. No problem at all, my brother. About uh, about what's been going on, so I think Daryl's gonna said he would uh, try and watch. So. Oh, okay, great, great. I'll give him a he, shot. Wants, he wants to see how his brother does. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Keeping an eye on you, making sure you're. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we locked in with each other, man. We're locked in. It's uh, funny. I was telling Kim, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I used to, I used to uh, watch this uh, this guy play soccer. Played uh -huh. for Man he played for Manchester United. It was the biggest soccer team in the world, and he right, was the right. goalkeeper. What's that, Manchester United? Yeah, he, he was the yeah, goalkeeper. Was... Gary Bailey. And I used to watch Gary on TV. And then I went to a networking event about a year ago and met his wife by chance. And when I saw her last name was Bailey and I saw her business card, which had a photo of him and her on it, I said, is that your, is your husband, Gary Bailey, the goalkeeper? She said, yeah. So I said, you know, I said, can I meet him? She said, yeah. So we, I ended up going to like meet them for coffee. And I, st I keep it, you know, I, I've kept in touch with them. And every once in a while we text about soccer. But it's the same. It's the same feeling I got when I spoke to Daryl this morning. It's like, 
I'm like, man, I used to watch that guy on TV, and now I'm like texting with him. Like, it's a little <laughs> mind blowing. <laughs> when I go to New York with him, they still almost bow down to him. Yeah. It was amazing. One day we were like, down in lower Manhattan, and this old Japanese lady must have been 89 years old. And she looked at him, you know, screaming and had her little granddaughter. Went, hey, and speaking in Japanese, couldn't speak English. Hey, him, 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 he number one, you know, hey, he, she knew who he was. Hey, can my granddaughter take a picture with you? You know, I'm like, wow, look at this. Even, yeah, and hey, listen, another thing, uh, when he was coming back up to the big leagues, you know, we had to go through some, some stuff. Yeah. Um, he was signed autographs. We was in uh, Syracuse, New York, uh, AAA up there. And they had, after they won, they cut the lights off in the stadium. And he was still standing out of autographs. He said, hey, Mr. Stur Strawberry, you got to leave because we're um, you know, getting ready to close the stadium. He said, I'm not going to leave until I sign every one of my fans' autographs. He still do that today. He will stop and sign. And I look at him when I say, and that's why people love him. He's, he's, the, first, he's the real deal. Yeah, versus Barry Bonds, who the worst guy ever worked with in the Yankees is off the record, by the way. Right. Alex Rodriguez. What a fucking scumbag. Nasty disposition, everything. And I'll talk to you on the other side about that because we got uh, one minute. So let's let's get it live and then I just want to set everything up and then we'll rock and roll. So hold on a second for me, okay? <sighs> All right, so hold on one second. We're actually live now, so give me just a second to... Yeah. Uh... All right, so we're ready to rock. All right, give me a second here. We're good to go. All right, Roman Raider, rock and roll, my friend. All right, everybody, good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of The Cleaner Show. This is the Drug and Alcohol Facebook Live Show. I'm Mark Astor, the founder of Drug and Alcohol Attorneys, a law firm in Boca Raton, Florida, dedicated uh, to only one thing, and that's helping families and individuals who are in crisis because of addiction and mental illness. And today I am super excited to have another unbelievable guest, on the heels uh, last week of Daryl and Tracy Strawberry and my good friend Kim Coslo, and it's uh, it's our, my good friend, my now good friend Ron Doc. So Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. Thank so you. Just, Thank you for just, by way, just by way of background, folks, Ron uh, has more than 21 years of experience in the recovery industry. He's a certified addiction counselor. Uh, he's a certified intervention professional and a, a nationally certified recovery coach. And he also served as the intervention coordinator for the for 15 years for the New York Yankees, and he served honorably in in Vietnam. And we're going to talk about all this stuff today. But wow, Ron, I am I'm blown away, uh, and I'm super excited to have you on the show. So thank you very very much for um, for just giving me you know giving us the time and sharing all your experience with us. And you know I didn't realize the uh, the impact that we would be having last week, but a lot of folks reached out to me after we interviewed Daryl and were so inspired by him. And I think that when they hear what you have to say, they're going to be equally inspired. And, you know, the name of the game, you know, the reason that, you know, you and I and Daryl and Tracy and Kim and all the other wonderful folks in the treatment industry do what we do is because we're trying to help a lot of people. Right. And we're in, the middle of, we're in the middle of a national epidemic here. So thank cool. you very, very much for coming on the show. 
You're more than welcome, welcome Mark. Uh, two corrections before we go on. Go ahead. A, Correct me. A, I worked for the Yankees for 17 years. And that's All it. right. <laughs> and B, I have uh, October, I'll be celebrating 26 years, not 21. All right, that's uh, okay. Listen, I stand corrected. I apparently I didn't give I didn't I didn't give you the credit. Did you, you get the memo. You 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 saw so, yeah. I get the memo right. I didn't get the memo, so I apologize. I apologize. No problem. No so problem. Um, Ron is coming for us uh, from a, you're in your home in St. Petersburg, right? Yes, I am. St. In Petersburg. Florida. Yes. So you know the 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 Ron that we see here uh, live today is um, comes from somewhat humble beginnings. And, uh, you know, let's talk about that a little bit and then we'll get into the, to the meat and potatoes of, uh, of, of, you know, what, of your journey. Cause I think that's what it's really all about. Sounds but good. T- tell the folks at home where you, where you came from, where you were born and raised and, and all that other fun stuff. Great. Yeah. I came from um, a little hamlet called uh, New York city. <laughs> I'm born and raised in the Bronx. My mother had five kids. Three of us were triplets. We were born two minutes apart. Um, I have a younger brother had past tense he passed away along with my triplets uh, two of them passed away as a direct result of uh, drugs and alcohol um i have a sister that's older than i she lives in richmond virginia uh, my upbringing was awesome you know i grew up in a melting pot and a diversity of um, families i we grew up in the projects and in new york city the projects go up close up to 15 16 uh, stories high and each building, we had Italian families, you know, uh, Spanish families, Irish, uh, African-American. It was a really amazing, Mark, because you come home from school and you smell the di- various dishes and you can go up to Miriam's house, who's an Italian family, knock on the door, and you, know, you can go in and eat, you know. So we had a very close-knit family. And growing up in New York, in the Bronx, I wouldn't trade for anything in the world, Mark. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And it mold me to who I am right now. Well, wow. okay. So I, we'll, we're going to talk about um, your brothers and your sister in a minute. But um, was remember rightly what you told me yesterday was you were raised by a single mom for the most part. Is that correct? Right. My father left us when we were approximately five years old, and my mom was a proud mother. You know, she worked all her life. She wasn't about welfare, but any assistance uh, we can get, she you know they she received it, but it wasn't in the form of welfare. Like I said, she worked all her life. And okay. she did the best she could to uh, raise five kids by herself. So how old were they when, you're, when your father left? Um, I believe we must have been like five years old. Okay. and Maybe younger. Maybe younger. And yes, it, it took a toll on me as far as abandonment issues, you know, and um, rejection. You know, I caught that very early. Well, and then, go ahead. I'm sorry. Know, you know, then positioning myself within the family for attention from my mother you know, a food, you know, uh, whatever we had going on, because you had five other siblings, four other siblings, including myself, looking for, you know, validation, if I may say, you know. Right, so where, where were you in the pecking order of, of the siblings? Hey, today could be number one, tomorrow could be number three. Okay. You know, whoever was feeling the strongest that day. But the one that always reigned was my sister. She was one, one year older than I. And she was no joke. She had four brothers, so she used to jack us up. She was a heck of a fighter, you know. So, uh, yeah. Are you, are either your mother or, uh, or your father still around? No, my father passed away approximately fifteen years ago, and um, you know, longer than that. I'm sorry, twenty years ago. My mother just passed away two years ago. She was ninety four years old by the grace of God. And this woman, you know, I think she was one of the strongest women women on the planet. You know, to see three of her sons pass away as a direct result of this disease and hang in there. And I, I'm a firm believer because my uh, staying clean, I added some years to her life. She was so proud of me, Mark. You know, which um, I used to go up to New York from Florida, you know, to visit. And uh, she would tell the whole world, this is my son, how proud she was of me. And to see that twinkle in my eye, I know it gave her some, you know, some life, you know. Wow. And, uh, Grateful she had a chance and opportunity to see one of her sons clean. And, and so, and what, and what did your father pass away from? Um, he was in, a, in his addiction. He was drinking, and uh, from my understanding, in uh, Georgia, and his house caught on fire, and uh, he got caught up in the fire and passed away through what third degree burns. Wow, I'm sorry. Yes, no, uh, no problem. 
But when we, when we spoke yesterday and I asked you what life was like uh, growing up in, uh, in New York in the Bronx, you said, I was running the streets of New York trying to find my way, but I was a really good athlete. So, and I think you said it was like being in a Bronx town, right? So maybe give us an idea of what, you know, what was, uh, what was life like for young Ron Doc growing up in, uh, in New York in the Bronx? Let me explain that um, A Bronx Tale, number one, if anybody's seen, it's a great uh, movie with Robert De Niro. Um, it wasn't so much about racism in New York versus uh, neighborhoods. You know, you're walking in any neighborhood, it was off that, you know, it was off base. Whether it's a Puerto Rican neighborhood, Irish, Italian. If you walk that line, you know, you get in trouble. So it's more uh, about demographics in the uh, neighborhood. Uh, number two, um, Yes, I used to run track at basketball, love basketball, and I wasn't involved with no substance abuse. I wasn't too fond of school because school, you know, sometimes could be a nightmare back in the day, you know, especially in the uh, Bronx, New York, and you didn't know who you were going to fight that day, if, if this was going to happen. And um, I just wasn't uh, someone that was a student to her education at that moment, you know. And I started uh, acting out behind that. You know, I wasn't coming home at 16 years old, I was staying out. I remember sneaking on the subway, going down to 42nd Street for the first time. And I think that's the time I lost my mind. I seen all these lights and the hustle and bustle of 42nd Street in Times Square. It took my breath away and I fell in love with it. So me and my brothers used to sneak on the train and go down to 42nd just to hang out. You, and, uh, go ahead, Mark. No, you go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this, this went on. I love New York, you know, and, um, through all this discouragement, I had a best friend. His name was Ruben Ruiz. That's what I was going to ask you about, Ruben. Tell me about yeah. Ruben. Yeah, he's a Puerto Rican um, friend of mine who lived in my building in the projects, and he was my best friend, and he was missing. So I asked my mother, where was he? And no one knew. And one day, he came home with a Marine Corps dress blue uniform on, and I was smitten. I was wiped off the map. That was the first time in my life I knew what I wanted to do. And I was best to join the Marine Corps. And my mother said, nope. I went to her uh, after I wanted to go to the Marine. She said, number one, you're 16 going on 17. There's no way you're going in the Marine Corps. There's a war going on in Vietnam. And I, you know, being young and naive, I thought Vietnam was on the other side of Brooklyn. You know, I never heard of Vietnam, you know. And, uh, and I remember growing up, uh, I was really into John Wayne. And, all, and everything he did, you know, my favorite movie was The Sands of Iwo Jima. You know, I saw that, I just went nuts. And as a kid, I had little green army men. You know, I used to position and pit battles on the floor. And that, back then, you know, we didn't have all these computers and everything. We used our minds and our imaginations. And I think we did very uh, well with that. And... Uh, well, let's, let, me, let me ask you. So we're going to talk about Vietnam because that's, that's a pivotal time in your life. Um, but before that, before you before you, you joined the Marines, um, had you been exposed to you know drugs and alcohol and things of that nature? Um, very lightly alcohol, and that was through the uh, my parents, my not my, my parents. You know, my mom used to give parties, and uh, my uncles and everything came over. That's why everybody actually, if you think is a um, social disease, uh, is it a, a social disease or is it an hereditary? And I said both. You know, with me, it was uh, social. I should see my mother and the relatives, you know, partying with all this alcohol. I, hey, I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And I uh, remember as kids, my um, cousin came up. We stole a fifth of Jack Daniel. And we ran in the room, me and my four brothers, all of us, and we drank it. And that was the first time, you know, I got out of hangover. Got very How old were you? Gosh, we must have been about 11, 12. You know, let's do like our uncles did. Look how they drinking like that. And we was drinking it straight till my mother went in the room. He, we had puke all over the walls. <laughs> hey, it was like five, six kids in a room. All of us were drunk. And uh, that was the first and last time I drank because I had a hangover for three days. And I was uh, uh, 11. I didn't touch no alcohol, anything else until I was uh, of age. So that was the first and last time. Okay. So, a good lesson. A good lesson. Were you, yeah, were, yeah, big lesson. Were you into sports growing up as a kid? Yeah, like I said, I was in the track, uh, okay. 440, and uh, basketball, you know, and that was my two favorite sports. Uh, we had no baseball fields in the Bronx. 
you know, that, that, well, they had some over uh, another part of where we grew up. So our favorite pastime was stickball, right in the middle of the streets. And um, we loved doing that, you know. Yeah, like I said, we know that was a precursor to what was the, what was to come with, uh, with the, with the Yankees. So, yes. so I know at some point you, you you ended up signing up for the Marines, uh, the Vietnam War. Right. Um, so tell me how that happened. Yes, I started rebelling on my mom. You know, I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to do anything because I was angry now because I wanted to go to the Marine Corps. She said, no. So I said, I'll fix you. She said, no, no, no. I'll fix you. And she had me locked up as a juvenile. So when I went before the judge, I said, your honor, you know, hey, I told my mom I want to go to the Marine Corps. She said, no, but this is what I want to do. The judge looked at my mother and said, hey, will we leave my courtroom? Sign them up for the Marine Corps. And that's how I got, uh, at 17, I went to the Marine Corps. I went to Paris Island, South Carolina. I went to boot camp down there. How long was boot camp? It was, um, do you, have you ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket? Sure. It was exactly like that. Back then, you know, they would put their hands on you, they were in your face, you know, call you everything but the child of God. And I thought being from New York City, I knew how to curse. <laughs> like down there, I'm like, oh my goodness. He just called me a maggot or, you know. <laughs> Something like that. Some of the rhymes yeah. of that. And I, get it. I look back at that, those days and it dawned on me the first sponsor in a 12 step program was my mother. If I would have listened to her, you know, I probably wouldn't have been in that situation. But I got down to boot camp and all heck broke loose at 17 years old, kind of, you know, threw me back. I was petrified every day, but I hung in there and I graduated. So, what, how, how long was it before they sent you off to Vietnam? Okay, I went to a boot camp for eight weeks. And from there, um, they sent you to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina for what they call advanced infantry training. And from there, um, I, I left there and went to Camp Pendleton in California. Now, my whole outfit went over uh, in 67. Uh, but I couldn't go over because I was 17 years old. You cannot go into combat until you turn 18. So I stayed behind in January uh, 1968, I turned 18. Uh, February 1st, I was in Vietnam. Well, so while you were going to Vietnam, I was just, just celebrating my first birthday because I was born okay. in Cali 67. Okay, yeah. well, you were still, still peeing in bed then, huh? I, yeah, I've no doubt about that. Wow. So, yeah. so, so tell me, I mean, you get to Vietnam. I mean, you know, we, we only know Vietnam, but, you know, in that era really from the movies. I mean, what, give us some idea what it was like over there. Well, it's everything you have read and um, seen on, in um, documentaries. You know, we say war is hell, but combat's a son of a bee, you know, and it is. Um, I remember uh, landing in Da Nang, and when the door opened from the airplane, the intense heat hits you in the face, and you're like, oh, my God. And I almost froze at the door. I, like, I didn't want to get off the plane because I was petrified. And got on the runway, and then you smell the country. The country has a real pungent odor about it, you know, and that's what the rice paddies in the field. And uh, basic hygiene of Vietnamese, you know, back then, it wasn't like we took showers every day. You know, they were washing the rice paddies or whichever way they can get it. And you smell that, you know, and that was the other thing that threw me through a ringer. And it felt like you went back in time to the Ming Dynasty. You know, everything was like it has never caught up to that, that period in time. You know, they wow. still use sickles in the rice paddies and the water buffaloes uh, plowing the uh, rice paddies. It was really a twilight zone, you know, for the first couple of days, you know, being a kid. So, so how long did you ultimately spend in Vietnam? Been 13 months in uh, combat. I was up north by the DMZ with the 3rd Marine Division. Okay, so, yeah, right. so you saw some live action, right? I saw some live action, and I would like to leave it right there. It's all right with you and the you know, family members. But, uh, yeah, Fair it enough. was um, some intense time. I remember uh, the first firefight. Um, I went into shock. When I got back to the rear, I... Um, uh, yeah, uh, started smoking uh, marijuana and drinking to calm my nerves, and it did everything it was supposed to do. Okay, so 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 really, so 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 the, so the sort of story of your, you know, I guess you know, addiction really begins in Vietnam, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I think it's pretty well publicized that you know a lot of the one there was a lot of drug use going on over there, and two, a lot of guys came back messed up. I mean, so so you were you were you were smoking marijuana, you were drinking a lot, so. 
I mean, does that go on for the whole time you're there? The whole time I was there, and I need to tell you why. And that's right, when we used to kill the enemy, we go in their pockets and get their opium and smoke it. You know, and uh, they use the opium. So uh, when they go to combat, they get wounded. They won't feel it. You know, you have to get uh, like a head shot or really get into them to uh, bring them down. But anyway, uh, yeah, you started smoking and drinking. And it did everything it was supposed to do. Take you outside yourself, give you a full sense of security, numb you. You know, It made me escape from what the, uh, the fears and everything I was going through. And it intensified. I brought, um, I didn't bring a monkey back. I brought a gorilla back to the United States. Yeah, I'm sure. It sounds to me like you weren't the only one who was smoking a lot of weed and drinking a right. lot of alcohol. I mean, was that was that something that was sort of somewhat rampant over there? It was rampant. It was the norm. It was the norm. As a matter of fact, uh, even the uh, military would give you two cans of Budweiser beer per day. Uh, you know, that's part of your ration for you to drink. You know, wow. so yeah, they played a role in my um, alcoholism too. The uh, military itself. Wow. Hot, 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 hot Budweiser. So when did you come back to stateside from Vietnam? I came back uh, March of 1969. I, I just turned 19 years old. I was still very, very young. And I felt like an old man, you know, that I had seen the other side of, uh, uh, the other side of something. And I couldn't identify with my brothers anymore, my family, because I was in a different um, place, you know. And then again, I miss my brothers that I left over there. You know, I had a, um, a thing called survivor's guilt. That started kicking in, you know, uh, why uh, this person got blown away and I'm, and I'm coming home. So it was a lot of psychological issues I was dealing with. And wow. that, that compounded my substance abuse, too. So, so how long did you actually spend in the Marines? Because you came back from Nam. You, yeah. Three, long, and a, three and a half years? Yes. And okay. when I discharged out the Marine Corps, I was only 20 years old. I was still too young to even go into a bar. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, so when you came back, even though you were still in the Marines, did, 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 tell me about the, 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 the drugging and drinking. Was that continuing or did you live it back? Yeah, and it, it elevated to a high level because I was uncomfortable with me. I didn't know who I was, number one, you know, and I, we used to call it bush crazy. What that means, I was in the jungle so long, you know, you kind of get, you know, become an animal, you know. I remember at the table eating my food and my mother trying to talk to me and I'm telling her to shut the fuck up. You know, I'm trying to eat, you know, I was acting out like that, you know, and um, I started having flashbacks. So they started taking me to the VA hospital and staying two and three months at a time. So how many, you know, how many times did you, go, did you end up staying at the VA? Oh, quite, um, I can't count, you know, quite a bit, quite a bit. And back then they, they didn't have the diagnosis PTSD, they called it shell shock or battle fatigue. Okay, so what, did they give you any kind of medication or anything like that for it? Yeah, that's what I was say. Hey, all I had to ask, whatever I wanted, they gave it to me, whether it was Xanax, uh, Percocet, you know, uh, back then Darvon, you know, all the um, uh, drugs I wanted, they get, you know, to keep us calm, you know, they gave us whatever we wanted and we took it. Okay, so you're, so you're taking medication from, from the VA. Right. Uh, still drinking, smoking a lot of weight? Yeah, a lot. More drinking and smoking, yes. Wow. I'm, I, we, I mean, I'm amazed you were able to function, frankly. Um, yeah, I had windows of clarity, too. You know, um, During those uh, windows, I had a chance to go back to school and uh, get my GED because I dropped out in the ninth grade to go in the Marine Corps. And um, came back, got my GED, and uh, I got a job... Uh, with the uh, Department of Corrections in Washington, D.C. I decided to leave New York and go down to Washington, D.C. because I had relatives there. And I became a correction officer down there. And I did that job for five and a half years. So that gave me a chance to act out what I left in Vietnam, you know, which is fighting. Right. You know, you told me yesterday that the, the, the inmates had a name for you. What was that? Oh, you used to call me Officer New York. Officer New York. <laughs> officer New York, yes. And, um... I had a lot of respect for them because I knew they were human beings. They wasn't convicts or, you know, this and that. So I gave them the respect and they gave me the respect back. I remember coming to work drunk and they put me in the cell and laid me down and let me know if my, um, if my supervisor would come. They would wake me up and say, hey, man, your captain's coming. Get up. They had your back? Yeah, they had my back. Absolutely. So how, how, long, how long were you a corrections officer? Five and a half years. It burnt me out, you know, and I had to just walk away from it. Okay, so, so what came next? Uh, what, was, what was the next uh, thing you did? 
Yeah, another geographical change. I floated back up home. You know, home base was New York, so I go into the Bronx. My mother had a three-story brownstone in the Bronx, so off of uh, the Grand Concourse, not too far from Yankee Stadium. So I went there and regrouped, and then I got another job working as a sanitation worker in New York. I did that five and a half years. And uh, on both jobs, like I said, I'm a smart dope fiend, by the way. I've never been fired. You know, I saw it coming out with a design, or they would request that I resign. You know, and being a veteran, they gave me a little leeway. Yeah, they. You told me yesterday that you. I mean, it sounded like you was you were still going to work either either because you and you'd been drinking or using drugs, and you were crashing into cars. And that's what you told me. Is that right? Hey, but with the sanitation department, no, I was crashing garbage trucks into grocery stores, <laughs> hitting brick walls. Uh, in the winter time, they put plows in the front of the uh, sanitation trucks, and I would plow cars up into the air. You know, roll them over. You know, so they called me in the office and said, Doc, we love you, but you need to resign. We're you done. Know? We're done with you. Yeah, we're done. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay. Was, I, was there a point in time where, where you, because I wrote down here, you got locked up on a psych ward at some point. Yes, I was locked on a psych ward quite a few times from uh, New York, uh, Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, here in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, Montrose, New York, that's over by uh, West Point. And that's when they diagnosed me. They told me, that's how I got down to Florida, by the way, Mark. Um, they came to me and said, we started a new program in Florida, a place called uh, St. Petersburg. I'm like, I'm from the Bronx. I said, where the heck is St. Petersburg? I thought it was a place where Catholic nuns and priests come down to retire. <laughs> you know, hey, what I know, you know. So, but, um, and uh, because, like I said, they didn't diagnose P they, PTSD, it was called battle fatigue, but they was, starting to diagnose it in um, St. Pete, Florida, and that's when they gave me a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, so so when did you come down to Florida? What year are we, are we at now? I think it was uh, 1983. Okay, and right. so I, I remember you told, telling me about a conversation you had with your mom because she said at some point she, you, you know, we want to know if you were going to come home, right? And, and you, hey, uh, you well, remember tell, tell us about your response because it was quite <laughs> interesting. Yeah, Mark, when I came down here to uh, St. Pete, Florida, it didn't dawn on me. I was landing into the cocaine capital of the world, which is Florida, due my, my, to the Miami corridor. And um, I started looking at all this cocaine and got involved with it. And I called my mom. I said, hey, listen, I found paradise. I'm never coming home. You know, and it was beautiful because I've never been to Florida. And I got off the plane. I seen a palm tree for the first time, orange groves, grapefruits, you know, uh, people fishing. I'm like, hey, I like this. And I knew I was going to stay. I knew it. And I didn't last. I lasted maybe two years. And I went back to New York homesick. I lasted up here six months and came back and I stayed up. And I've been down here ever since. Okay. So, so, so when you came down here to St. Petersburg, were you, were you in a program for, for PTSD? Yes, sir, I was at Bay Pines VA Hospital. Got and, it. Oh, I, okay. I didn't complete it because I was bringing drugs into the uh, dorm. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. I was a renegade, you know, and they kept putting me out the program. And, uh, bringing me back to the psych ward after I had an episode. And uh, that went on for years until um, October, 1992. Yeah, I think a pivotal date I wrote down, October 5th, 1992, and I even wrote down the time, 1.40 p.m. Absolutely. Tell, us, tell us about that day, because that's a pivotal day in your life. Right, did you write down the temperature? I did, 88 degrees and sunny. Absolutely. I take notes. I'm a lawyer, you know, I, I write stuff down, my friend. I see, I see Mark. Yes, that was a pivotal time for me. It was one of many um, runs, and I, I just got tired of being sick and tired and living like that. And by the way, I need to retract, Mark. Okay. Excuse me. I was homeless three and a half years because I didn't want to uh, spend no money on an apartment or anything. So I lived in shelters. I knew where the best shelters were, the best soup kitchens, and I got comfortable in that. You know, the stores that do away their vegetables at night, I knew how to go behind a dumpster and get it. And I did that, Mark. So where did you get money for drugs? Uh, labor pools. You know, that's like day labor. You know, you work for the right. day, they pay you for the day. And being a disabled veteran, I get my check at the end of the month. And uh, that's when all my friends would come around because they knew I was getting that VA check. And uh, a day or two after it was going, they, they were going too. You know, everybody left. But that was a pivotal time. I, you know, I got tired of being sick and tired. I went down to like 115 pounds. You know, I didn't eat in three days, so I tried to commit suicide. I jumped in front of a car, and I didn't even walk. And when I looked up, it happened to be a police car. 
And um, the police, you know, handcuffed me, said, hey, I'm taking you to jail. I told him I've been drinking and drugging all night. I don't care. You know, I'm ready to die. Right in the middle of his run to the um, uh, jailhouse, he stopped. He said, no, I'm going to do something different. I'm taking you to a rehab. He took me to a rehab, and I went there, and he grabbed me. He said, hey, man, well, he didn't use my uh, explicit words, but you need to get your, your shit together and turn your life around. And I'm like, wow. And um, I went to that treatment center, and the light went on. There was a little old white lady came to me because I was raising hell up there. He grabbed, she grabbed me by my collar and said, son, if you don't turn your life around, you're going to die. And I remember crying uncontrollably. Yeah, that's not tears. And I knew the light was starting to come on. That's the day I surrendered, Mark. And I haven't looked back since. So that's October the 5th, 1992. Just out of interest, I know I didn't ask you this yesterday, but did you ever see that the officer again, the police officer almost ran you down? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I, I was like, yeah, I yeah, myself, yeah. you know, did he ever speak yeah. to the cop? I mean, that's the question, right? <laughs> so, listen, I had a year clean. I went down to the uh, police department here in St. Pete, and I knew everything was on the computer. I said, hey, October 5th, 1992, about 1.40 in the afternoon, a cop arrested me. And uh, I wanted to know his name. They gave my ID, they saw my name, and he was with the SWAT. He said, his officer uh, Jones, whatever his name, I don't remember the name right now. The dude came down. I said, I don't know if you remember me, but last year on Central Avenue at 1.40 in the afternoon, you arrested me. Instead of taking me to jail, you took me to rehab. I want to let you know I have one year clean. The officer, he teared up a little bit. He said, hey, man, this is why I do this job. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yes, I did see him, Mark. I'm glad you brought that up. That's great. And it was awesome, you know, reunion with him and I. So, so my understanding is from that point on, you, you, you are clean, and you went back to school. Is that right? Right, right. I went to St. B. College of Associate in Human Services, got my certification as a certified additions counselor. And... um. Moving forward, I was at a meeting and uh, this guy was sitting in the corner and I was telling my story. And after I told my story, he got me say, hey man, I need help and I'm looking for a sponsor. And it dawned on me who he was and um, it's, it's public record. This is why I'm not breaking no anonymity. So that's why I will mention his name and it was Dwight Gooden. And if you Google my name, Ron Donk, you see this whole story uh, on Google, you know, how it went down with him and I. And at first I was scared because I said, man, you do a good hand. You know, I don't know how to deal with no celebrities. And I, I have never been in that arena. It kind of overwhelmed me. And I have to be careful, you know, with my ego and everything else, because these are things that can get me high. And I knew that. And being two years clean, you know, I didn't know how to deal with it. My sponsor told me, wait a minute, Doc, he's an addict just like you. You need to help him. So I did. So I started working with him. You know, I told him to come back. And uh, he kept coming back to the meeting. So I said, look like you serious. So I'm going to work with you because I wasn't going to do it if you're doing it to get back into baseball or some other agenda. And um, I started working with him. So he took me to the Yankee complex. That, so that would have been for like spring training down here in Florida? Yes, exactly. During uh, spring training of 1996. That's when I was introduced to the Yankees. And I was working with him, and uh, off and on, in 98, uh, George Steinbrenner came to me and said, hey, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I know you're working with Dwight. And no, excuse me, let me be backtrack. One of the uh, farm directors came to me by the name of Mark Newman. Matter of fact, he's my hero, was in the Yankee organization. I'll tell you about that later. <clears throat> he said, hey, I got a kid here from, a um, little white kid from Tennessee, got caught up in Tampa, Florida, uh, and he was smoking crack, a pitcher. He said, I, can you help him? So I started working with him and uh, he turned it around. And then he told me, we've got another kid that's smoking weed. Can you help me? Then another kid drinking. I said, hold it, hold it. It looks like you have a need for me. Let's develop something here, you know? So I came up with the program and I, as an intervention coordinator and the rest is history. And it was supposed to be a one year contract and it lasted for 17 years because each year, both players and staff were having um, issues, not just limited to substance abuse, could grief counseling, marriage counseling, whatever they needed me for, uh, peer mentoring, you know, shoulder to cry on because I'm homesick and I, you know, I want to quit baseball. I was there for the whole gamut. So, so let's backtrack a second. T tell us, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, you sort of read, you, I've read about Steinbrenner, you see him on TV. I mean, you obviously had a very 
you know, sounds like you had a pretty close relationship with the guy. T- tell us about it, because he seems like he'd be a very t- tough man to deal with and, you know, um, short on patience. What was, what was George Steinbrenner like? Good question, Mark. Mark, I personally loved him. And I learned everything about baseball, uh, business, um, eye to details from uh, George M. Steinbrenner. He was the type of guy that would cut you with a razor blade from but with a razor blade from head to toe, but he would take you to the best doctors. And I'm gonna be honest, if he found that you were weak, he would breach that and go walk, walk over you. He didn't like weak people around you. I've I've seen him make grown men cry. And I'm looking at these guys like, you know, this is a man just like you, you know. But again, if you were weak, he would run over you. Bottom line, he tried me yelling. I yelled back, and who are you yelling at, you know? And he calmed down. Oh, well, come in my office. Let's talk. All right, then. Don't you ever yell at me. And, hey, I loved him. I loved everything I learned about baseball business and, you know, how to exert yourself. And like I said, he had an eye to detail. And another thing, but he wanted to know who everyone in the Yankee organization, what they did from the grounds crew, hey, what's your job here? And he knew what everyone did. Everyone. He see a piece of paper on the fi- uh, floor, hey, you're the grounds crew, you didn't pick that up, you're fired. And before you can get out the door, get back over here, you know, go pick that up. And I, I want you to turn it around. He used to call me, everybody had to kick out this, he used to call me his drug guy. Whenever <laughs> they, yeah, whenever anyone got in trouble, he would yell, where's my drug guy at? You know. And wow. uh, yeah, he was hilarious. He was hilarious. Well, you know, it sounds like a one and he was just a, a really tough business guy. But I mean, yeah. he obviously brought you in because he cared about the players, right? I mean, if he had a player or a pitcher or a hitter that he had a drug problem, he didn't say, listen, just cut the guy. Let's get rid of him. He's like, hey, Bronk, I need you to help this guy. Absolutely. His thing was, hey, listen, um, a guy deserved to get treatment and go back to work. Everybody has faults. And he knew that. He had family members that have substance abuse problems. I think one, you know, died behind it, you know. But, uh, yeah, he had, um, he had, uh, he was uh, proactive about uh, EAP work, employees assistant professionals. And his main thing, hey, yo, if you have a problem, I want you to go get treatment, get help, and come back and go back to work. And he, he was in the front of that more than any other owner or, you know, general manager in the, uh, any sport for that fact, not just baseball, back then, any sport. Do you think back then that, you know, drugs was a problem, not just at the Yankees, but in a lot of the teams, maybe even yeah. other sports? I, every sport all over the place, yes. Back in there, especially 70s, 80s, yeah, absolutely. And for the most part, it's, a lot of times it was socially acceptable. You know, for Daryl and Dwight Norton to go to Studio 54 in New York, where well, the cocaine mecca. You had cocaine, that means you had a ride, you know, it was part of prestige. You know, alcohol was prevalent all over the place because it's legal. Pills, you know, that's how uh, Bill Cosby got caught up. But back, he was telling the truth. Back in the day, it was quaaludes. That was the thing. Today, it's um, Xanax and the rest of these uh, new drugs, you know. but Crazy, crazy time. So yeah. you met. You met Daryl in 90, 1999, and I read a little bit about because I read Daryl's book, and it's right. it's mind blowing. It's and yeah, I yeah. talk about it, but this is kind of where I was introduced to you. And I read back here, and I realized that there were three really important people in Daryl's life: mm-hmm. uh, his wife Tracy, uh, Kim, Kim Coslow, and you. And I read, and I was, uh, I said to Daryl, you know, and as we talked before we came on, I had a chance to chat with, with Daryl very briefly this morning, and I, and I said to him, man. I don't know what you did in this life, but in the past life, you must have done something really good because between Tracy, Kim, and, and Ron, I said, I don't know if you could find three more loyal people who loved you more that wanted to save you. Right, right. So, and Darryl, my, he what was Daryl like in 99 when you met him? Hey, he, hey, he was a lovable guy, but the only one guy hated him, and that was him. I remember him hitting a home run. He came in, they gave me a, a curtain call. And he said, Doc, man, I had all that and I was real unhappy inside because I didn't like who I was. You know, um, I remember one of his last runs, you know, he got busted in Tampa and uh, he had cocaine trying to pick up a prostitute. So they put me on him. That's how I first got on him. And I was at his house in Tampa and helicopters were flying over the house, a thousand paparazzis outside his house. And I, I wasn't used to that. So I got a little panicky. I'm like, Daryl, man, you know, look at what's up, what's with all of this? He said, hey, man, this is what it's about, you know. 
I said, well, I'm not with this. I didn't sign up for all of this. So, uh, you know, I hung with him that day. So that night I went home. And the next morning I looked outside my house. There were four cars out there. So I went outside, my pajamas, you know, a bat. I'm like, yo, what you're doing outside my house? They said, hey, man, we're at the press. We saw you leaving Daryl's house. How he, How was he doing? What's happening with him? So I said, no comment. You need to leave my house. But right then I started getting paranoid, you know, and my nerves got the best of me to the point I broke out from head to toe. And my wife called them uh, strawberry bumps because I had bumps all over my body where my nerves got the best of me behind this intense environment that I just got introduced to, Mark. Wow. And I still so one of my last runs with Daryl, you know, he called me, said, Doc, if you don't come get me, I'm going to commit suicide. And he was in Daytona, and I live in St. Petersburg, which is 94 miles away, approximately. And I ran the I-4 corridor from St. Pete to a Daytona for 85, 90 miles an hour. When I found him, he was behind the 7-Eleven at a dump, uh, dumpster on the ground, uh, filthy, maybe weighing 150 pounds. He had uh, residue of cocaine powder all over his shirt. So I grabbed him and put him in my car and, and um, took him to back to Tampa to the psych ward where he had a chance to come down and uh, regroup and get it together. You know, and these are some of the experiences I had with him. I know when he uh, told the judge, the judge said, hey, we're going to release you on your own reconnaissance. He said, I don't want it. I want to go to jail. And um, that's when they sent him um, to a year in the penitentiary and um, fraud the Department of Corrections up in Gainesville. And I was up there every Sunday to uh, spend time with him and, you know, work with him. And I used to tell Daryl, I said, Daryl, you're going to do God's will, alive or dead. And what I meant by that, if dead, you may be a martyr to some other person. Hey, if this can kill Daryl, it can probably do the same to me. Or you can do what you're doing right now, Daryl, is doing a ministry and carrying a message to uh, people that, you know, hey, if Daryl uh, can turn this around, you know, maybe I can do it. And I'm so proud of that, brother. Yeah, you know, very Yeah, proud. I mean, I, you know, see, I didn't know him back then. And I've, I'm just barely starting to get to know Daryl a little bit. But, you know, I mean, you, you meet him and he... I mean, even, you know, I, the first time I saw him was a couple months ago at the Sud Talks and right. he came out and I was, you know, frankly, a little, I was like, wow, that's Daryl Strawberry. And he was really humble. And then when you get to know him a little bit, I mean, he, I mean, if you didn't know he was Daryl Strawberry, the baseball player, you'd be like, wow, that's a really humble guy. He, uh, absolutely. he goes Extreme, down to love. Extremely humble. And that's why the planet love him, you know. And, you know, hey, whoever's listening to this uh, Facebook Live, Hey, you can turn it around, man. Success stories are there. You know, your whole life can change. If it can change Daryl, myself, from a garbage can, you know, prison. And this disease don't care if you come from uh, Yale or jail or from Park Avenue to the park bench. It wants you dead. And I have not found anyone that be, you know, that came on the other side of this by using. Yeah. Wow. So let me back up a second, because you, you met Doc first, and then you met Daryl. So tell us a little bit about the relationship between Doc and Daryl, because when I spoke to Daryl last week, I mean, he sort of confirmed what I thought, which was they were, they were like, I mean, they were, they were brothers instantaneously. I mean, they just clicked. Right, because they were the only African-Americans in high profile as they were because of the age. Because of the age, think about it. Dwight Gooden was 19 years old when he went to the big leagues. You know, Daryl's 21, 22, you know, a lean, lanky dude from California with a unique name, with a freaking unique right. name. I have not met an African-American named Strawberry. So I met this dude, you know. I met one named Ice Cream, just joking, you know. But uh, Strawberry, yeah. And I'm like, wow. And I was living in New York. And I remember my mother saying, because she loved the Mets back then, she said, son, look at these two black boys. And uh, he said, they're they going to be great. And she loved both of them. And, you know, speaking of my mom, she had a blessing. Uh, Daryl Strawberry uh, one day came to my mom's house with me. And, uh, you know, a nice, modest brownstone, nothing, you know, with middle, middle income. And um, he spent the night there. And my mom, on the couch, my mom got the blankets for him. And she was like, a, uh, you know, in heaven that Daryl, and then Daryl would sit on the porch. And the neighborhood knew he was there. And that kind of made me uncomfortable. All these kids came and they were pulling out down strawberry pictures. And I'm like, where y'all get this stuff from? He was just here, you know? He sat on my mother's porch and signed every kid who came to my mother's porch, signed your autograph. 
you know, these are the things about this human being that the world, lo that's why they still love him. It's amazing. Um, I wrote a name down here, uh, Dickie Knowles. My, that's my boy, Philadelphia Phillies. He do the same thing I do, and uh, he's like my uh, my partner. You know, I love him to death. You know, he uh, he's my twin for the Philadelphia Phillies. Okay, you know, is he still active? Yes, he is still active, absolutely. You know, matter of fact, I will give you his information after this cast because you need to talk to him. I'm right. magical, man. magical. And as a matter of fact, he was my mentor when I first came in with the Yankees because he was with Philadelphia for a while. So he told me how to address the players because I didn't know the etiquette of how to uh, maneuver around um, Major League Baseball players without interfering. What, you know, there's various protocols when they're practicing not to talk to them. You know, when they're doing this, stay back. When they're in their locker rooms, when to engage them. You know, there's a lot of protocols that I didn't know because I wasn't a baseball guy. So I had to learn on the run. And Dickie Knowles was my mentor. I love are, him to death. Are there, are there still guys like you and Dickie who, are, who work with the baseball teams? Only Dickie Knowles and myself were the only ones who were on both sides of the track that has some experience with substance abuse and that been in the trenches in all facets of life. The rest are clinicians, you know, that came out of school, they got the book sense, but no common sense. I said it and I hope they're listening, you know. And the players told me they didn't like them, you know. And uh, for example, you, you're gonna come to me about um, my issues with Vietnam and you're a psychologist. And at first I'm actually, well, you have in the military. If you say no, I said, well, you can, it's not a damn thing you can tell me, you know. And, and we did that to the point the VA got a uh, psychologist that was in the, uh, that was in the military. And uh, became left and became a psychologist. You know, so um, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when I was when I was sort of doing a little research to to uh, to, to interview you and to, and to chat with you, um, I noticed that, and you mentioned this yesterday. There was a couple other. You, you, you talked about Steinbrenner, but there was a couple of other coaches that you really you know looked up to and, and felt they really cared about the players. Um, I think one of them you talked about was Nick Saban, which was a bit of a shock to me because he comes across yeah. as a very tough guy and, you know, it's either my way or the highway. Yes, uh, Nick Saban, the University of Alabama, Jimbo Fisher with Florida State, those two were very proactive. They loved their plays and they were bringing myself. I went, I've been with uh, Nick three times already and the last time with Daryl and Strawberry and I, we both went. And uh, just to talk to his plays about the consequences of substance abuse, in my case, you know, what I've seen working with the Yankees for 17 years. And the number one thing that got players out of the baseball was substance abuse. And the number one drug in baseball or in sports is what? Alcohol. Right. Alcohol has gotten a lot of the players outside the game. So, yes, Nick Saban, um, Jimbo Fisher, very, very proactive. They love their players and they do everything to uh, nurture them. And, and they make sure the whole coaching staff buys into it. That's the trick. They told the coaching staff, you're not buying into what's happening. Get out of here right now. And with the Yankees outside of Steinbrenner was Mark Newman. He was extremely proactive because a lot of the um, front office outside of Steinbrenner who didn't care for what I was doing because in their mind, we don't need Doc. We can take care of this ourselves. So who, who, was Mark, who was Mark Newman? He was um, in charge of player development. He was a uh, vice president of player development. He came out of uh, California, and uh, he's, been, he's been a baseball guy all his life. And matter of fact, Baseball America deemed him a genius of baseball. He is. He is a genius of baseball. He knows anything you want to know about baseball, he, the velocity of a, of, a, of a ball flying through the air. I mean, people are thinking that, Billy. Really. This is his mindset. He, as a matter of fact, he's a professor. He taught at the University of California, if I'm not mistaken. And he's a lawyer, you know, so a very bright guy. He lives in Tampa. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. Um, you know, one of the other things they, they talk about when they talk about addiction is the fact that it's a family disease. Talk to us a little bit about that and maybe explain the dynamics of that. Well, you just heard my story. I lost three brothers as a direct, direct result of the disease, you know, and it took a toll on my mom, you know. It took a toll on my daughter. You know, I was the one that uh, brought my daughter all these gifts for Christmas. And Christmas Eve, I go back and take them back to get them to the dope man so I can keep running. I did that, Mark, you know. And um, 
uh, I've seen families, you know, in my intervention uh, quest, you know, they're the main culprits of helping their sons or daughters and the big enablers, and they need help themselves. That's why I really refer Al-Anon to a lot of your family members, you know, to get yeah. I, you know, I see that in my office when I go to, when I, you know, when I meet with a family and, you know, we're talking about, you know, some type of intervention using the court system. Um, and it's a difficult decision for the families to make, but I, I noticed that the, the sort of toll that it's taking on the parents and, and the siblings. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's a dynamic that people don't understand when they, they, they're sort of looking on the outside in as to what's going yeah. on. Right, unless you're in it, you don't understand what what is real. It's like almost like a like a metastasizing cancer. It's just slowly eating away at the family unit. Right, and you mentioned that yesterday, and I like to touch in on that. Um, that was probably one of the best interventions I ever ever had. Getting locked up, going to jail. It gave me a chance to you know regroup, get uh, get off the streets, you know, think about my behavior and try to change it. And I tell family members that way, hey, I hope your daughter or your son get locked up. If not, they're going to die. And they will look at me like, how dare you? I have to say that. Because if they stay out there on the streets, what you want? You want to stay out in the streets, you find them behind a garbage can, OD, or in jail. At least you know where they are. You go visit them, and, and they probably have the court system come in and do an intervention on them through drug court. You know, people like you, lawyers, lawyers like you that's helping the families. You know, I know you're saving a lot of lives. So what you're doing. I'm trying. And, it's the best, the best intervention is getting locked up. I love it. Well, look, I always, I always tell uh, families, you know, I mean, you've got really, there's only one or three places your kid's going to go because the, the, these diseases get worse, right? If you have addiction, mental illness, they typically run together. Your kid's either going to go to treatment, right? You're going to make the decision they can't make. They're going to go to prison. Well, they're going to go to the morgue. That's it. There's no other choices. And we say that in our literature, one of our 12-step literature, which I don't want to name right now through um, – yeah, policy, which is um, this uh, three ways up: jails, institutions, and death. You just said it. Those are the only three jails, institutions. I've been in both of them. The only one I'm still, by the grace of God, I'm still alive. But if I go back out, I know it's waiting for me. So, um, what do you what are you doing with yourself these days? I'm glad you, I'm having a ball, Mark. You know, I do uh, a little intervention here and there, not much. Um, I'm doing meetings every day, you know, I do help newcomers that come into meetings. Uh, my wife and I, we traveling all over the planet and as, as directors of staying clean in August, my wife and I are going to Alaska for two weeks. And, um, if possible, if I have some downtime, I'll find me a meeting and people look at me, wait, well, you in Alaska, what you mean you're going to find a meeting? I said, well, if I was in Alaska using, I would find some dope. You know, so if I put that much energy in my recovery as I did, getting high, you know, I stand a chance. And that's what I do, Mark. I've been to Milan, Italy. I've been all over the country. Wherever I go, I hit meetings because this is what keeps me clean. Even oh. 20 years, I still do a lot of meetings. So you're in St. Petersburg. So if somebody, if somebody wants to, you know, maybe connect with you, how would they do that? They could do that. I'm, you know, I have a, a number I like to give them, which is, you know, if they're really serious about recovery, I, you know, you can call me at 813. Three three five, three eight four zero. Give that one again, because I'm going to write it down. Eight one three. Three three five, three eight four zero. Give. A, is there a website you have? Yes, I have uh, starsarsober. dot com. Starsarsober. dot com. Right, and uh, if you need treatment, you can go to the Dallas Strawberry Recovery Center. And their telephone number is eight seven seven five six zero eight seven five two. That's the Daryl Strawberry Recovery Center. You can go online. You can grab it online. It's an awesome center. I highly recommend it, along with Kim Coslow's. Um, yep, I was there with Kim this morning, and I'm going to be out at Daryl's place um, probably in two or three weeks. Great. So I know that you're a, you're a married man, and Daryl, you know, in Daryl's book, he talked about the fact that, you know, his addiction ruined a couple of his marriages. And I, I think, it's, which, what, which marriage is for you? Is this number three? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, I'm just joking. It's three. It's and, three. and I also two, like, that... like I told you yesterday, the first two I don't remember. And the first one, you know, she gave me a beautiful daughter. You know, I have a daughter and uh, five grandkids and uh, two from my uh, wife's uh, daughter and son. So together blended uh, five. But the first one, my heart goes out to her because I was uh, having a lot of flashbacks. I just came back from Vietnam. You know, I used to wake up choking her. Not intentionally, but I was having flashbacks severe. 
and I had to get away from her. Not, you know, of course, the abuse was kicked in, uh, was kicking in, and it was something I couldn't control because of my issues of uh, just coming back. And my second one was strictly about the addiction, so I definitely don't remember her. But this is the third one. I've been, we've been together 20 years, and um, love her to death, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. How'd you, the- how'd you meet her? <laughs> I always ask, you know, as a single guy, let me tell you, as a single guy, whenever I meet an, a happily married man, I say to myself, how, the, how did he meet his wife? How did this happen? I need to know. Because how complex, how complex I am. You know, I had put in myself that I was going to be alone the rest of my life because I'm, I'm complicated. And I have, you know, things that I'm not, you know, there with. You know? And um, I said, hey, I had a nice three-bedroom apartment. I was happy. And I was in a grocery store that I, used to, I go to in the neighborhood here. Uh, and uh, one of the cashiers who know me, you know, I was messing with her. So this lady next to me, won't you leave her alone? And I turned around and said, won't you mind your business? You know, she said, you make your, won't you mind your business? And I said, I said, what are you, what are you, why are you messing with me? And she had a nursing uniform. I said, oh, you're a nurse? She said, yeah. I said, where? She said, the VA hospital. Oh, you one of them VA nurses, huh? Yeah, pain in my neck, you know. And she went off, and, and I said, you see how you're laughing? I started laughing. I said, hey, I'm sorry. What's your name? And the rest is history. I met a new grocery store in mine. Wow. Mine, mine, yeah, she started messing with me, and uh, boom, the rest is history. It sounds like she, she strained you out from the minute she met you. She started <laughs> you out and said, I'm going to straighten him right out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she did. Life. She did. It impressed you, me, man. Yeah, you know what's, so what's funny? When I interviewed Daryl, and 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 uh, Tracy was speaking. You know, uh-huh. and he sat back there like he was. He he just he was so proud of her. And I see the yeah. way you talk about your wife, and it's the same look. And I can tell you, you're you're, you're incredibly hey, proud. Listen, I'm a complicated guy, a Vietnam vet. For this woman to put it with me, she is an anointed woman. Are you kidding? I'm not an easy case, Mark, and I know it. You know. Wow, but it's yeah. not, it's, it sounds like it's been a crazy, crazy journey for you. It's been, but you know what? I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. I'm glad. I, hey, this has been one of the most amazing rides of my life from infancy until this present day. You know, I wouldn't trade it. And, and listen, that last run, if I didn't get that last run, I'd probably be dead right now. I'm grateful I, I had all those highs because it made me the human being I am today. You know, I'm getting ready to open up a 12-step spiritual program at my church. You know, I'm just doing some things different. I'm giving back because God told me, let me run this with you, Mark, and I'll end. I said, why did you pick me? I see all these guys around me that's got the same, they relapse and left and right, but I'm sticking and staying. He said, I got one job for you, Doc. He said, I want you to carry the message to the next addict who still suffers. That's all I want you to do. I said, that's it, Lord? He said, that's it. No more, no less. Just carry, you know, help some, help another addict. And I've been doing that all my life. That's well, it's, it's new life, excuse me. That's, that's amazing. I yeah. know that you're still very, very close with Daryl. Yeah. That's um, I mean, you guys are like brothers. And, I, you know, and when I speak to, to Kim, she talks about her brother Daryl, and he calls her yeah. sister. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing collection of four, four people. Do you, yeah. just, you still keep in top, uh, touch with, uh, with Doc Gooden? No, not really. Um, you know, he's doing his thing, and, you know, when, when he needs me, I'll be there for him. You know, so, but that's my boy. I love him to death. And, you know, sometimes it's good just to back up and let people be people. And when, you know, they need you for anything, just be there. And that's, that's where I'm at, you know. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. I, I, you know, I could sit and talk to you all day, but I got to go and have some lunch. I haven't eaten yet. But before we go, I want you to give out those phone numbers again, your number, uh, the website, and Daryl's number. And then I'm going to give out my information. So you go first. Right, right. Um, my number is uh, Ron Doc at 813-335-3840. You can actually get me on my website, which is stars, the letter R, sober, at dot com. Yeah, at dot com, excuse me. All right, so, and, uh, and, uh, Daryl's Place. And Daryl's Place, uh, Daryl's Strawberry Recovery Center. That's in Saint in Orlando, by the way, St. Cloud. And that number is 877-560-8752. All right, and and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give out Kim's information. So Kim, Kim um, is over at Futures, and I was actually there this morning. And I'll tell you, it's uh, it's an unbelievable place. So if you're interested uh, in in finding out more about Futures, you can give Kim a, a call. I'm gonna give uh, Kim's number out. She gave it out last week, so I'm, I feel comfortable giving it out this week. Kim Koslow, K O S L O W. She's an amazing, amazing woman. Nine five four five four zero 
8441. 954-540-8441. That's Kim's number uh, over at Futures into Questa. And um, if anybody wants information about what I do or how to get a hold of, of you or Daryl or Kim, they can reach they can reach out to me. So let me give um, give out my phone number, which is 561 419 6095. 561-419-6095. Folks, can you email me? Uh, Mark, M-A-R-K, at drugandalcoholattorneys.com. Mark at drugandalcoholattorneys.com. And if that doesn't work for you, they can find us online at drugandalcoholattorneys.com. Ron, wow. I mean, the last two Thank weeks, uh, I've been bl- blown away. I mean, uh, Unbelievable. So I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, sharing your story. I read about you here, and actually, we connected on Facebook after I interviewed Daryl. I think I wrote to you, you so are a saint. I meant it. Right. Thank you very, very much for sharing a very welcome story. Hold on for a second. We're going to log off Facebook, and and we'll stay online here, okay? Hold on a second, okay? Thank you very much. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're off Facebook. Wow, Ron. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like an NA meeting to me. (laughs) Well, I tell you I feel like I've been a, 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 to, to a meeting. I'll tell you that. So, listen, I'm going to go up and see Daryl's place in a couple of weeks. When I spoke to him this morning, um, I think Tracy, he said, was in Kenya. Yeah, I mean, I saw the pictures. I mean, she, she's in Nairobi. Yeah, and I said, oh, listen, you know, I want, to come, I want to come up. I mean, I'd love to, you know, I mean, I obviously want to see his place, but I'd like to see, you know, I want to see, I'd like to meet Tracy and, you know, you know we're right. going to go up there. I know Kim's going to come with, and I don't know if you have the chance to join us, but, wow, it'd be great to see you. Right, right. Well, maybe we can make that happen. Well, hey, do you, you know. have Dickie Knowles information? I don't. I don't, actually. I'm, um, I'm sending that to you right now. That's, yeah. Well, I, I'd love to call him. Would you give him a heads up that I'm oh, going to him? Hey, I don't absolutely. want to catch him sort of uh, unaware. Absolutely. absolutely. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. His, uh, you ready? Yep. Uh, 610, that's the area code, 357 2951. Okay. And as soon as I get up to a uh, line with you, I'm going to call him and tell him to look out for you. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But, hey, hey, a great story there. That's my boy. Yeah. Uh, hey, man, listen. That boy, hey, one of his favorite stories uh, that I like, he's with the Philadelphia Phillies pitching. He's a big 